you Frankie. Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Definition, aka your friendly neighborhood spoiler man, and this week we're breaking down the movie that changed everything. For better or worse, The Avengers kickstarted the shared cinematic universe trend that so many would try to imitate. Since its release, it's been picked apart in videos and breakdowns, and there are a ton of those out there. So, instead of focusing on all of the details that you've seen before, I'm going to be going over the ones that people haven't really picked up upon. This is purely because, when those videos were created, the films that these easter eggs pay off in hadn't been made yet. There probably will be a couple of things you've seen before, but hopefully this video is full of brand new information. Obviously, there will be heavy spoilers here, so if you haven't had a chance to check out the film yet then what the hell yeah i don't need to give a spoiler warning but just in case this is your last chance to check out without the way thank you for clicking this now let's get into our breakdown of the avengers the avengers begins at a remote shield base that is centered around studying the tesseract Though the location is destroyed during the introduction, it actually makes another appearance in the MCU during the prequel story Captain Marvel. In the introduction, they walk past the sign for the area, and if you pause it, you can see the words Project Pegasus. This was of course laced throughout Captain Marvel, and Nick Fury and Carol both travelled there to learn about her past. This isn't the only link to Captain Marvel either, and on one of my previous videos, YouTube user Simpical4 pointed out that in the film at one point when discussing the Tesseract, Bruce says to Black Widow, what does Fury want me to do? Swallow it? In Captain Marvel, Goose the Cat swallows the Tesseract and contains it from the finale of the film all the way until the last post credit scene. This isn't the only thing that Bruce talks about putting in his mouth during the film, and whilst this is probably the worst link I've ever done, there's also lip service paid to Banner putting a gun in his mouth and the other guy spitting it out. This is actually a reference to a deleted scene from The Incredible Hulk, starring Edward Norton. In that, we saw Banner travel into the wilderness to attempt to finish himself and the Hulk for good. However, upon attempting to do this, the Hulk emerged and stopped him. This scene was unfortunately cut for being too dark for audiences, but it's nice that it at least gets a nod here. That film ends with Bruce finally gaining control of the Hulk, and when Black Widow meets him for the first time, he says that he could unleash the beast should they try to take him forcibly. Black Widow says that it's been over a year since an incident and that he won't want to break his streak, to which Bruce replies, I don't every time get what I want. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the line. I, I don't every time get what I want. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, while saying this, Bruce rocks an empty baby cradle. This shows that he wants a child more than anything, but due to his curse, he's going to be unable to have one. Later in the franchise, we learn that Black Widow was sterilized during her training in the Red Room, and it feels like this inability to have children and the pain that comes from that ties them together in some ways. During the scene, Natasha also gives details of the Tesseract to Banner, and in this shot you can see an image of Guru Chela. In Hindu culture, this is a man with two faces, much like Banner, who has two identities inside of him. Whereas Widow provides Banner information on the phone, when Fury goes to give the same to Captain America, he does so with a piece of paper. As we discussed in our breakdown of Age of Ultron, Steve gets his mission briefings on paper due to him being out of touch with technology. In that film it was a blessing, as Ultron wiped all digital copies of files, whereas here it's just a nice character beat that shows he's still a man out of time. In Iron Man 2, we actually see what could be a drawing of the Tesseract in Howard Stark's notebook. This ties directly to this film, and also Avengers Endgame, in which we learn that Howard was studying it. During the scene in which Tony receives his briefing on the cube, Agent Coulson overrides Jarvis's protocols in order to gain access to his private elevator. Stark says security breach, and this breach would later enable Dr. Selvig to get onto the roof of the building in order to open the Tesseract portal. At the same location later in the movie, we see Pepper and Stark looking over holographic plans for the building. In them, we can see that they are planning for a Quinjet hangar bay, and this makes an appearance in Age of Ultron, as well as Spider-Man Homecoming. Speaking of Spider-Man Homecoming, the Vulture's theme in that is actually the Avengers one in minor tonality. This is because the Vulture represents the twisted version of a superhero that uses their powers for bad. Stark caused the character to lose his job, and though the disgruntled villain that hates Tony Stark is getting a bit out of hand, it's nice that they decided to give a nod to this film in the theme of the main villain. 
The opening of Homecoming actually takes place right after the events of this movie, during the cleanup of New York. The monster we can see them salvaging from in Central Station is a beast that we actually see get killed in this film. This is carried out by Thor and Hulk, and it shows the attention to detail that goes into these films. In addition to this, the clock on top of Grand Central Station gets replaced after the events of this film, and in Age of Ultron we can see that it's become a monument to the first responders. During the battle, Tony confronts Loki at Stark Tower, and there are actually a couple of nice things that tie into other movies. We can see that there is a photograph of Tony and Pepper, and this was actually taken during the scene in Monaco and Iron Man 2. Stark tries to talk down the God of Mischief by saying there's no version of this where you come out on top. However, in Avengers Endgame, an alternate timeline is created in which Loki manages to get the Tesseract and escape, thus coming out on top. So yeah, there was, there was one version. What happens to Loki, we will find out in the Disney Plus show, but there are some great little callbacks that he and his brother get in the movie. Tony is thrown out of a window by Loki, and he is only saved by his Mark 7. The character barely misses the ground and nearly dies from the fall. In Endgame though, we can see how far the character's tech has come, as when he jumps out of the window, the suit goes over him much faster, showing that he's come on leaps and bounds. In our Endgame breakdown, which you should definitely check out if you haven't, we stated that Tony is constantly learning from his mistakes. After his nanotech was depleted in his battle with Thanos, the character decided to use an energy shield going forward. This constant desire to improve is also shown in this film and what would follow. Stark becomes trapped in a turbine at one point when trying to repair the helicarrier and his suit is severely damaged by it. In The Winter Soldier, we see that helicarriers now have rotorless engines just to stop the aforementioned point from happening again. As mentioned earlier, Loki features an endgame in a nice couple of scenes, and when Stark returns to Stark Tower, we see Thor say that they're gonna go out for lunch. This is of course a reference to the post credit scene for the film, in which they all go and get shawarma. Stark says he knows somewhere nearby, and this is because during the final battle, he lands beside the shawarma restaurant that they would return to for the final scene. Chris Evans has his hand over his mouth during this, because the scene was filmed after the premiere as a joke. Evans was filming Snowpiercer at the time, and he had to have a prosthetic jaw in order to cover up his beard. In the other post credit scene, which features the debut of Thanos, we learn that to challenge the Avengers is to court death. This is a big nod to the comic books, as in that, Thanos was actually in love with death, and he wiped out half of all life in the universe just to try and get her attention. Thanos is commanding Loki in this movie, and the two have a sort of tete -a tete over it in Infinity War. However, it is possible that Loki was also fueled by the Mind Stone, which was corrupting him. I don't know whether it's his skin, his eyes, or what, but this isn't the Tom Hiddleston that the world would come to love. Before being captured, Loki attacks Germany, and Cap compares him to the, the old Chancellor of Germany whose name I can't say because, yet yeah, YouTube liked to demonetize videos that mention him. What's interesting is that that guy died in 1945, which is six years after World War II started. Loki died in Infinity War, which is set six years after the events of the Avengers. That's probably just reaching though. When Loki is held in isolation, you can actually see a small panel that is scanning for heat signatures in the room. Loki's body temperature is pretty much non-existent, and this is because the character is a frost giant. Tony also calls Thor Point Break, and this would come to be his voice recognition password for the Quinjet and Thor Ragnarok. In the film Thor headbutts Tony, you can actually see a dint in his helmet from it. Yikes. Now a key character arc in Avengers, and the Infinity Saga as a whole, is that of Tony Stark. In the film he's accused of not being willing to make the sacrifice play, however by the end of the movie he proves that he would when he flies a nuke up into the Tesseract portal. Why this is significant to the rest of the MCU is because the music is actually the same that is used when Tony takes the Infinity Stones from Thanos in Endgame. Both show that he actually was willing to make the sacrifice, and this is a really nice callback. The movie ends with Fury talking to the World Security Council, and most of them would reprise their role for the Winter Soldier. Powers Booth would go on to feature in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and pretty much all of these return for other projects. They also discuss Phase 2, which is of course a very meta thing to say in the MCU. The film ends with a montage featuring Stan Lee, and we can also see a canvas of the Iron Man image that Stark hung up in Iron Man 2. And, fun fact, I also used to have that as my phone screensaver. As always with the MCU, I had a hell of a lot of fun making this video, and I hope you enjoyed it too. 
Obviously, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the tidbits, so comment below and let me know. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of the insane details that we noticed in Avengers Age of Ultron. There's some crazy things in that, so definitely check it out after this. If you want to support the channel and get to see content early, then please consider clicking the join button below. You can also come chat to us on our Discord server, which is going to be linked in the description, or at DefinitionYT on Twitter. Those are the best ways to keep up to date with the channel, so hopefully we see you over there very soon. This is a channel for people who are super into superheroes, so if that's the kind of thing you like, hit subscribe. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. I've been Definition, you've been the best, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.